The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. So we're doing the church series and we are in part two, the gifts and roles. Can a Christian survive apart from a church? Can a Christian survive without being a part of the church? That is a big question that many people are asking nowadays because some people seem to be disappointed with something or the other and some people are just helpless with their situations but the question is can a person survive without a church the answer is both yes and no <clears throat> yes because if you're trapped in sickness and illness and you're bedridden at home and you're not able to go to a church um, that's one condition where it's okay not to be a part of the church, a physical church where you can't go. Or sometimes a person can be working in an isolated area where there's no churches whatsoever. And uh, yes, even without these helpless situations where you don't have a church, you can still go to heaven. Okay? You can still go to heaven and you can still survive. But this is not the norm that God established according to his word. This is not the normality of a Christian individual to be independent Christian. Last week I talked about the cultures and how they influence an individualistic mentality versus a relational mentality. Where I come from, it's all relational. Back in India, it's all about relations, relations, relations. And everything is done as a group constantly all the time. And in North America, one of those things is this personal space and individualistic mentality that seem to dominate our culture, but also that infiltrates into a church where I'll go with my own personal relationship with God. I'll have my own individual thing. I have my secret personal Christ that I don't like to share with anybody and I don't share my faith because it's all personal, personal, personal. That's the individualistic mentality, which is right. Both have a place in the scripture. Individually, we need to have a relationship with God. That's individually, we need to walk with him consistently. And out of that individual walk, you will be able to be effective in the body of believers. So it's both are important, but majority of the time we see this individualistic attitude that creeps into our lives in our culture that we are living in. The attitude we say, yes, we are a body, I belong to a church, but yet we act as if we are the captain of our own souls and masters of our own destinies, but God doesn't allow that. First Corinthians 12, 12 says this, the body is a unit, though it is comprised of many parts, and although its parts are many, they all form one body, so it is with Christ. As a body of believers, we are many, but we are one. It's important to understand the distinguishing factor between a body and an institution. Church is primarily an organism. You're with me so far? Church is primarily an organism, not an organization, primarily. We are a spiritual being that God established in this world to survive, to sustain, to bring the kingdom of God into this world. That's what we are, the church, organism. Okay, so we need to focus more on this organism. But how does a church become a church? How does a church survive? There are three factors I want to talk about this morning. Number one is sacrifice. It requires sacrifice. Church requires Sacrifice, church requires unity, and church requires functionality. All these are essentials for a church to survive. There are many more to this, but these are the three areas that I want to focus on. 
sacrifice and a sacrificial life individually with God, unity collectively, relationally, unity is important. And that's how we become functional. What is sacrifice? How can we understand the sacrificial element in the church body? Romans 12, chapter, verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God, God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. These are the words that need to be etched into every Christian's heart. We are called to be a living sacrifice. When Paul was writing the scripture, the temple in Rome still existed. It wasn't destroyed by the Romans. And in order to understand what this sacrifice involves, let's see what the priest actually does. A, a person can bring a sacrifice, a sacrificial animal to the priest. It needs to be blemishless and flawless. And when the priest gets this animal, the animal's insides are taken out. Anything under the skin, under the hide, is taken out and is laid upon the altar. Everything on the inside is laid upon the altar. Altar, when it's burned upon this bur as a burnt offering on this, uh, on this altar, that goes to God as a pleasing aroma. So the insides belong to God. In a moment, you'll see where I'm going with this. The insides of your life, your soul, your spirit, they belong to God. An individual, when you make a sacrifice, when you say you, sacri you sacrificially love God, it means you surrender your soul and your spirit to God. It belongs to Him. I have been in crusades and meetings where I I've seen a preacher invite once and say, uh, every cigarette or whatever your addiction is, throw it on the altar. No, you don't throw your cigarettes and your drugs on the altar. Okay, you give your insides upon the altar. The something that is the real you, something that God has separated you, that your heart belongs to Him. Your mind belongs to Him. That's what goes upon the altar. So what happens, next question we need to ask is, what happens to the hide or the skin of the animal? Any guesses? You're murmuring something as if you know the answer, but you don't. I used to do that in the classroom too. I used to like, uh, I think I, uh, you know, but I didn't know the answer, but I used to act. Okay, you're doing the same thing this morning. I can spot that. Anyway, hide. Where does the hide go? Where does the skin go? The Bible says in the book of Leviticus, it's very clear. Also, the priest who presents any man's burnt offering, that priest shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering which he has presented. The skin belongs to the priest. What is the priest going to do? Make wallets with it? He's going to do something with it. You know what he's going to do? He is going to write the scriptures upon the skin. He's going to dry it as a parchment. And upon this, the Torah, the Tanakh, the law of God is written. So the insides belong to God. And what happens to this written scripture upon the skin? It is for everybody to see and read who God is. Where am I going with this? Your insides belong to God, but your body needs to be a testimony for other people to read about who God is. Your body, your flesh is a witness to the God you surrendered your life to. Very simple. That's what sacrifice means. Insides, the heart, everything of the, that nature belongs to God. Outside the body, it's for others to see the God whom you have surrendered your life to as a testimony, as a witness. To bring it all together, without your proper surrender to God, without your soul and mind and heart being given to God, there is no way you can be a witness and an influence to others. Without consecration and separation of your life and having this individual intimacy with God, 
There is no way you can influence others and be a testimony unto others. So that is what sacrifice actually means. And Bible says this is the true form of worship. But you're saying, but I thought worship means singing. Somebody asked me in India when I just got saved, and they said, lead praise and worship. I didn't know what praise and worship was. I said, what is praise and worship? He said, praise is fast songs, worship means slow songs. So, okay, got it. Fast songs, slow songs. I thought worship was slow songs. Then I read the Bible and it says, worship is giving my life as a living sacrifice unto God. This is the act of worship. We need to get that mindset uh, tuned and renew our mind in this thought where my insights belong to God and the outside belongs to others. The first thing that the church requires is this individual love and sacrifice. And this, this is how our relationship with this is established between us and God and us and others. The next thing I said is unity. What is unity? Unity doesn't come without sacrifice. Unity doesn't come without a proper perspective and understanding of love. If we do not have the true understanding of God's love, we do not know how to love others. If we do not know what Christ has done for us and know His nature, we will have a hard time loving others because it is His love that is poured into our hearts that will enable us to, and that will compel us to love others. His love in our hearts, loving others. That's what will drive us to love us. That's how unity comes. And the scriptures time and time again compare us to the, to the body, an organism, a body. So body has many members. We all have many members. For example, how does this function? For example, here you are, and how does unity work is very simple. Imagine one day you've never seen fire before. Imagine you've never seen fire before. The hand says, hey, that looks pretty attractive and red hot. And that hand goes and puts itself in the fire. And all of a sudden, something is not working well. There's a message that is communicated from the hand and goes all the way to the brain. And brain says, your hand is going to burn. Better pull it out. Mayday, mayday, abort mission, abort mission. Okay, that's what the brain tells. Okay? And then what the brain says, guys, other members of the body, are you awake? Yes, sir. Muscles, now act. So the other members of the body pull the hand out of the fire. And all this happens very quickly. Don't you realize that? See how wonderful God made our body, you know. Hey, man, if only we had this time to process this information, you'll be losing your hand by the time you realize what happened. But thankfully, God sped up this process. And what you see in this picture is very simple, but very critical in understanding unity. There's one member of the body who's hurting, who's going through a hard time. And the other members are also connected to the head, the Bible says, who is Christ. If you are in tune with your God, you will feel the pain of others. You see that equation? So if you are in tune with your Christ, who is the head of the body, you will begin to understand there's another member of your body that is hurting, and then you will act, and Christ directs you as to what to do in their lives, and you act, and an action from other members brings about this unity, and as a team, we work together. Make sense? How beautiful is this picture? What is a better way to understand this? There's one picture that's one of my favorites that gives you a beautiful picture of what unity is. It's, it comes from the garments of high priest. Exodus 28 and 29, the Bible says, when Aaron uh, enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel on his heart, on the breast, breast piece of decision as a continuing memorial before God. The high priest who was the mediator between God and man in the Old Testament, he wore something on his chest. It's called the breastplate. And on this breastplate, there were three, uh, four rows of 12 stones, three each. And on these stones were the names of the tribes of Israel. And this high priest, before he entered into the presence of God, he was anointed with oil. 
If it's anointed with oil, does not not one and two, one or two drops. They used to pour oil upon his head. And what happens, just visualize this picture, okay? And this is recorded in Psalms, and the psalmist says this. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to live together, together in unity. It is like the precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down upon the collars of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon was falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. What is this picture? So what happens with this high priest? So this high priest is there. They anoint him with oil. They pour an oil over his head. And this oil runs over his hair, over his beard, upon the collars of his garments, and then slowly passes through the grooves between the 12 stones that are upon his chest plate with the, 12, uh, the names of the 12 tribes upon them. And when this priest enters into the presence of God, and the light and the glory, the Shekinah shines upon these stones, or the, from the menorah, when the light shines upon this breastplate, because of the oil, and because of the oil filling in those grooves, these 12 stones appear as one. You see the beautiful picture? The oil flowing from the head to the heart. What is that picture of? Who is the head? Christ. And uh, who is this names written? It's the body of Christ. We with our diversity. We with our different names and backgrounds and cultures and everything. We who come together. The connection between Christ and the church is made through the flowing of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit in the scripture. When the Holy Spirit flows through our lives, we will appear as one in God's presence. And when His light shines, we will be as one. What a beautiful picture of unity, isn't it? I like the pictures in the Old Testament, how they clarify the new. So the unity is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. You know, unity can only come with the Holy Spirit, ladies and gentlemen. Unity can come when it flows through our lives. Without the Holy Spirit, we won't be concerned for each other. Without Him flowing through our lives, we will not be caring for each other. We can do and have all kinds of secular agendas to bind us together. We can do all sorts of things to create this unity to become something. But it's not the same as being bound by the power and the Spirit of God. And that's the unity that God expects, and that's the unity that God likes to see within the church. The third aspect now, functionality, okay? Functionality. What does this function of this body look like? We made this sacrifice, sure, my insights belong to God. I love my neighbor because God has poured his love into my heart. He's, I'm loving my neighbor, and we are united. Now, how do we function as a body of believers? How do we function? Romans, Paul continues to talk about, you know, he talks about, you know, renewing your mind, living sacrifice, then he keeps going with Romans 12, verse 3, he says, For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with faith God has distributed to each of you. The first thing Paul instructs is like, okay, now you guys are one, First thing we need to remember is not to think highly of ourselves, but esteem one another. Esteem, the, uh, esteem others that God places in your life and make them special. And then he goes on to say, e, just for just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, though many form one body and each member belongs to all others. What a statement at the end. Each member, it seems, belongs to all others. Each of you is an extension of the rest. Each person sitting in the body of Christ is an extension of the rest. In order for you to be complete in the body of Christ, you need others. That's what the Bible is saying. You cannot be defined by your function by keeping you separate in the body of Christ. For example, 
If you take the spleen out of your body, sorry for the graphic description, you take that spleen, put it on a table, spleen doesn't have a purpose, doesn't have a function, it cannot be defined by itself. It needs to belong to the rest of the body in order to have a definition and a purpose for his existence. You as an individual believer who is existing by yourself will not have a definition unless you belong to the others in the body of Christ. Does it make sense? We are all attached in functionality. I need you, you need me, and we cannot be ourselves individually and express our Christian walk without belonging to the rest of the body. That's what church is. But some people argue and make a case and say, oh, I belong to the universal church. There's one body, one bride of Christ. I don't need a church. Biblically, every example that you'll see in the New Testament, people belonged and identified themselves with the local body. Yes, spiritually speaking, we are all one to the universal bride of Christ, the church. But locally, you need to identify yourself with a church. In the scriptures, you see church of Ephesus, church of Thyatira. There's also, there was also church of Jerusalem, church of Antioch. In the geographical area, you need to belong to a certain church, a local body. That's a biblical mandate. And you'll see all throughout the Bible. People, a congregation needs belonging. Just because we say, I belong to the universal church, doesn't mean you're going to be useful anyway. It's just like saying, I own a car. You own a car, you don't own a car if its uh, right fender is in Halifax, and its engine is in London, and its tires are in Mumbai. You don't own a car, it's basically an inventory for a junkyard. Unless these parts come together, there's no body. There's no substance and there's no real car that you own. You see where I'm going with this? You can say you're a part of a universal church, but you need to identify yourself with a local body. Many people ask me this question, but nowadays, which church can I go to? Yes, churches are struggling. There's no teaching of the Word of God. They become entertainment centers, which I don't agree with. And the philosophy of ministry, everybody wants to reinvent how church is done when the Word of God already tells you how it's done and how the church, the Word of God values prayer, fellowship, intimacy with God, teaching of the Scriptures. These are the fundamentals of the Word of God, and the people are walking away from these things and making them social clubs that's anti-biblical. So people ask me, where do I go to church? It's a very tough question to answer. I say the three things that you look for is a teaching of the Word of God, the church that values prayer, how shall be called a house of prayer, a church that loves one another, not superficially, but with the love of Christ. That's the church you need to belong to. The day you, I had said this again before, before at Seaside many times, the day I stop feeding you or teaching the Word of God, that's the day you either fire me or find a new pastor or leave and run away from this church. The feeding and the teaching of the Word of God is very critical for every church. Prayer is critical for every individual in the church, in a congregation. Loving one another with the genuine love of Christ, that is critical in every church. You with me so far? It's very critical to understand this. Just because somebody says, I belong to the universal church, it's basically a sign of pride to watch out. Some people say it with that attitude, I don't need to be submitting to anybody. Submission is biblical. Submit to the leaders, submit to the authorities, the God that God places you under, it's biblical. You need to know our Bibles to know how to do church. So biblically, church Yes, it is a spiritual organism, big entity. Globally, there's one bride. We belong and we express and we are a part of it, but locally, we all have a function and a role. So how do we function within the body of Christ? Let's get into the details of it. Paul says in Corinthians 12, 4, 
There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, in everyone, it is the same God at work. Paul says, in the body of Christ, there will be different giftings. There will be different aspects of how one functions. And 1 Corinthians 7, 7, he says, each man has his own gift from God. Some people say in Christianity, well, I'm not gifted at anything. Wrong. Bible clearly tells that if you're a believer in Christ, each man has his own gift from God. God has already given you a gift that you need to identify. You cannot say you don't have a gift. God has given you one. There's one primary gift that we all have. The master designer, God himself, designed the church to be effective in this world. He designed this church to be an influence in this world. He designed it in such a way that he could be glorified through our lives in diversity, bringing about unity. God knows how to take beauty, for, bring beauty from ashes. God knows how to take a bunch of dysfunctional people and transform them into his example and his testimony. A reflection of God's Son in this world. A testimony of Christ. He can, he's an expert in doing that. And he designed his body in such a way. He said, I give you a gift. Everyone in the body of Christ has a gift. And he kind of, Paul classifies into three categories. He says the kinds of gifts, kinds of service, and a kind of working. He uses these three different phrases. What are these uh, phrases about? There are three listings you'll see in the Bible of these giftings in the New Testament. There's one called the spiritual gifts. These are the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, these are also known as the manifestation gifts. The gifts of speaking in tongues, the interpretation of tongues, gift of prophecy, gift of working miracles. These all come under the manifestation gifts, the spiritual gifts. And some people uh, call the Ephesians 4 is the gift of the offices within the body. Within the body of Christ, overseers, shepherds, and all that, there's that other gifting that the Bible talks about. And the third category is called the redemptive gifts. These are called, the, uh, some people call it the soulish gifts. Your very nature of existence, whether you're a believer or not, this soulish gifts exist in individuals everywhere. It's like saying, it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. It's a duck. There's some natural traits that every individual has, that's called the soulish gifts. So we are a trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit, three parts to us. So all these three are important and critical in our lives. And we need to understand that all these gifts are given for the church to function, for the church to operate. Okay, I don't want to get into whether the spiritual gifts uh, ceased and all that stuff. That's for you to figure it out. But I see it as the fact that God has given his gifts for the bride to beautify itself and prepare itself for the return of the Messiah. So how can we understand? My focus is on the last part, the redemptive gifts. Many scholars try to work uh, a, a great bit of detail into, into an analyzing these redemptive gifts and they put them in categories. What happens with these soulless gifts means your nature is the way you see each other is dependent upon the redemptive gifts. The way you look at the world is also dependent upon these gifts. The way you affect other lives or interact with others is dependent upon these redemptive gifts. I'll give you one example. and It kind of gets getting boring here and there, so I'll have to throw in something. So I threw in a deer this morning, ladies and gentlemen. So what are these redemptive gifts? Okay. So imagine we... Our church had a get-together. We all gathered, and all of a sudden, a deer steps into a backyard. Okay? Imagine there's one person in our body who is uh, an artist, and all of a sudden, he, he's looking at the deer, and all he's looking at is these colors, the beauty of this creature. And he's saying, okay, what color should I use? How do I, or if it's a photographer, he says, okay, how do I capture this? Oh, the light is little too dark. Maybe uh, it, if it was cloudy, I could have. So artist things in a realm of capturing this image. And imagine there's a biologist in our congregation, and he's thinking, okay, where was its habitat? Why did it end up here? 
it was supposed to be in the wild where there were there forest fires there what is happening people cutting down trees so he's thinking in those terms if it's a physicist a guy who knows all about the dynamics of the body is like oh wow look at the biomechanics that it jumped over the fence how did it jump what a speed what a grace for this creature look at its muscle tone a physicist is thinking that but if it's a guy like Ryan, I don't know whether he's here, he's a hunter, he's looking at a steak. He's looking at six months of its food. He's like, why don't you come when I'm hiding in the woods and waiting for hours and you come into your, my backyard and he's thinking about his meal. If somebody else, they'll be thinking about what recipe would work for this Dear steak. So see, we are all looking at the same thing, but we are all thinking different. That is because of our nature, that's the redemptive gifts, that's the tendency, that's the personality. These are the things that I want you to focus on. This is what the Bible is talking about. So Romans 12 describes these gifts. There's seven of them that are listed. It is having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let's use them. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry or serving. Let us use it in ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. There's seven different ways that these giftings are there in a congregation. Every congregation has people with these seven giftings. Uh, the Greek word and the literal meaning of prophet is not the one who says, thus says the Lord. That's not the prophet we are talking about. It's a kind of personality. He's a guy who tells forth the truth. That's the kind of personality it is. A servant is basically an attendant or a servant. Who's, that's where the word deacon comes from. Deacon primarily means a servant. A teacher is like a teacher, a master in Greek. Exhorter. Exhorter is the one who uh, calls people near. The Holy Spirit is also known as the exhorter. So to bring people near. A giver is the one who thrives in giving. A ruler is the, is the gifting of ruling, admi not administration. He can stand before people and get things done. And then there's the gift of mercy. So I'm going to go through these gifts and this is where those cards come in handy, okay? So now take your card, and we'll go through these things one at a time, and I'll give you these personality types and the tendencies, and I want you to carefully think, which personality do you fit in? When I try to begin, when I begin to define and give you your traits, you'll begin to, re begin to realize, wait a minute, I fit in this category. So make sure you mark very carefully where you belong to, and that is your redemptive gift in the body of Christ. Okay, you ready? You are ready. Okay, let's start with the first one, the prophet. The prophet is a personal, has a personality. He has the gift to warn, correct, encourage people. He has a deep insight, and he loves the truth. And prophets are people who are always black and white. Okay? They either are here or there. They neither, they don't have, they kind of have a very hard time with gray areas. They struggle big time with those. These are the people who are always black and white. They have an opinion about everything. Okay? And they are verbally very expressive. These kind of people, the prophet kind of gifting, they stand on principles. Principles are very important for them. And when you have a discussion with the prophet, they don't have time for fluffy talk. They can cut right through the fluff, and they want to go right to the subject matter. Because of which, it's hard to maintain relationships with this gifting. Because they're very truthful and they go right to the issue, they would lose friends. These are the kind of people who, have an, who take the initiative to judge people and judge situations all the time. They have an opinion about everything. It's like a compulsion. If you're immature, you judge everything that you see. Like you can go to a grocery store 
and you, you, you know how to organize that stuff there. You have an opinion as to where they should have put the toilet paper. You would have an opinion as to, and you'll be upset with the system as to who moved the candy from here to here. You'll also work, look, look at the work ethic. You'll have a constant analysis paralysis in your mind where you're saying this clerk could have done this job better. She is talking to this individual a lot more. Not necessary. She's losing the customers. It's affecting the, affecting the business. So, so you are a judgmental person. And if you're mature enough, you'll keep your mouth shut even though your mind is working over time. Okay, that's the kind of personality a prophet is. He knows no fear. A prophet is not afraid of anything unless they're deeply wounded in life. They won't be afraid of anything. They don't care for much, um, many comforts in life. They're not like need a fluffy bed and a fluffy pill. They're not that kind of people. They don't look for that many comforts. They are very hard. Here is a drawback for a prophet. They're very hard on themselves not only others, they're hard on themselves. So they always kind of live, sometimes in conviction, they borderline condemnation. They live a condemned life before God. It's a very hard, uh, hard kind of lifestyle. And this is the gifting, the scholars say, has the largest range of emotions. Largest range of emotions. They have the deepest compassion, most mercy, and they are fiercely judgmental, and they can go through deepest depression, and they have great exuberance, and they have an extravagance in worshiping God. Can you name one character in the Bible? Elijah. He's one of those with the prophet gifting in his personality. So, are you one of those? If you're one of those, make sure you check that. If not, just wait. Okay, the next, next gifting is the gift of mercy. God's uh, special ability that he gives individuals to know how to comfort and help others, especially those who are suffering. People who have this gift of mercy are motivated by the intense desire to empathize with those who are hurting. Those who are going through a hard time. Their ability lies in the fact that a gift of mercy, this person can go to a situation to the person who's hurting and experience the person's hurt. Without being in it, they can feel it very well. Personality tendencies, they're very quick in responding to the hurt of others. And the strangest thing is, Everything that a prophet is not, mercy is. Prophet, I said, is black and white. Mercy, no. Mercy has a lot of gray areas. Okay, they can live without this or that. Right? And uh, they are, have great listening skills. They can listen very carefully and uh, be very patient and a great listener. And if you uh, are not mature enough in your gift of mercy... You can be manipulated. Usually, this gift of mercy has drawbacks when it comes to young people. For example, if a girl has a gift of mercy, and the guy, for example, that she falls in love with, or trying to help, she falls in love with, the gift of mercy person thinks, I can help this person, and after I marry that person, I can make their life better and they have a hard time recognizing the evil inclinations in an individual. And the girls with the gift of mercy tend to be swayed by these emotions, and they don't try to see the evil in some situations, and they might f fall and become a victim. So prophet, who has no uh, qualms about telling what is right and wrong, good and evil is very clear-cut, mercy has a hard time to call anything evil. Mercy is a person who is very gracious, always lives with these gray areas. You know, uh, these giftings are very critical to understand. You know, when I married my wife, I know what, what my gifting is, and I, you want me to share what mine is? It's the very first one. Okay, the prophet, okay? But a little bit of teacher too, but prophet was, I'm a black and white guy. I go to the store and I say, okay, this Lord, which one? Okay, that one. I go and buy, and everything I have an opinion. In my, you know, that's a, my wife has a gift of mercy. 
And I didn't realize that why doesn't she think like me? We go to a shopping mall, I go and buy my stuff, she walks through the mall three times, comes home, thinks for a week, and then goes to the store again, and, and that's how mercy operates. There's no black and white, they need time, right? And I can walk through a room of 100 people and have conversation with every one of them. My wife, with the gift of mercy, is stuck with the first person. That is how different the giftings are. Once I realized, ah, this is how God made her, and she realized, this is how God made me, we are comfortable. And strangely enough, mercy goes, goes with the profit of, uh, uh, mercy goes with the gifting of a prophet. So guys and girls, if you're looking for, you know, combination, there you go. Mercy and profit, they go together. Hot water needs cold water, isn't it? So there is that combination that God orchestrated, and this is a good combination. It works for me sometimes. Right? <laughs> it's all the prophet's fault all the time. So prophet, black and white guy, and usually prophets are leaders and all that, you know, capacity, mercy, very compassionate, long-suffering, patient, and they're very compassionate people. Next is the gift of a sermon. Okay, did you go through that? Is it getting clear? Okay, a little bit there. It's almost there. Maybe you want to listen to the whole thing before you make up your mind, okay? Um, servant. These are the people who like to do practical things. These are the people uh, who like to minister practically. They are so joyful in doing things. When you say, can you fix the door? Or can you mop that floor? Can you arrange? They just thrive in that. They have an intense desire to do stuff practically. But remember, Christ himself came into this world to serve, not to be served. To be a servant is not a demeaning, humbling trait. There's no menial tasks in the body of Christ. There's no small task in the body of Christ. But the gift of a servant is something special that God endows some people with. These are the people, without a servant, a church cannot exist. Okay? A church cannot exist. These are the people you can call on and say, hey, we need this. Can you do it? And you can count and bet your life on that. They are going to get it done for you. These people work hard in and out, day and night, and they love serving. The gift of a servant always likes behind-the-scenes stuff. They always like to remain behind the scenes. They hate spotlight. They hate standing in the front. They don't want anything to do with it. They actually get the job done, and they're behind the scenes, and these servants are very loyal people. Okay? They're known for their loyalty. They will respect the leadership. They'll submit to the leadership, and they, when they know the truth, they'll stand behind them continuously and be there for the leadership. The possible weaknesses of the gift of a servant is they emphasize a lot more on the practical than, a, than the spiritual. Many times you can take that imbalance where I got to do stuff, I got to do stuff for God, and sometimes you might miss the spiritual element of intimacy with God, and it will, you know, sometimes you can tilt that way as you're growing in your servanthood. You know, servant, the other drawback is sometimes he is very good at sacrificing his family for the sake of the church. You know, they become so busy in the body of Christ that they sacrifice their family and not be there for them in time of need, and they can be stretched too thin. We're all called to be servants, but there's also the gift of servanthood. Next is the ruler. Ruler is the one who can facilitate, lead, organize, apply structure to uh, a certain task that is given. He'll have goals in mind. He knows how to execute those plans. A ruler, the gift of a ruler, has the ability to express and communicate clearly with the people, to make them come on board and support the task or the task at hand. They're very good at delegating jobs. They're very good at supervising the tasks that are given. Can you see the combination now? A servant and a ruler. See the combination. See how they go in pairs. The servant and a ruler. Ruler is supervising, getting the things done. They are the people who can handle a lot of pressure. The gift of a ruler, they can handle a lot of pressure. They're very good at organizing events, but 
they can burn people along the way in order to achieve their goals. They're very quick to burn bridges for the sake of achieving these goals. These are the tendencies, mind you. These are not facts that are established, but these are the personality traits that the biblical scholars have studied and noticed in the redemptive gifting. Those are the gifts, those, that's the qualities of a ruler. The next is a teacher. A gift of a teacher has a supernatural ability and a desire to study the Word of God, explain it clearly, apply it effectively. They're very good at communication, they're very logical in their thinking, and they have a very strong emphasis on truth. They have very strong emphasis that the truth has the power to change lives. They love the Word of God. They love to study. They're disciplined in a little way, in their ways. But their problem could be they can tend to measure spirituality with the Bible knowledge. Okay? They have this temptation to measure people. It's like, how much Bible does this person know? Oh, based on that, they'll analyze their spirituality. A teacher has a very strong temptation to do that. And they also have a problem where they can be caught up with details. They like details, 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 and sometimes they smother themselves with details. So that could be a drawback for a teacher. A giver. You're with me so far? You're going through the list? So far, so good? Okay. A giver. These are practical people, again. They always want to support financially. And the strange thing with givers is they have the ability to give so much and they never run dry in their giving, in their finances. They keep giving and giving and they'll continuously supply the needs of the body of Christ. And these people are exclusively gifted for this, uh, for this uh, 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 gifting that God has given them. They are usually, they notice this, the givers are usually light-hearted people. Apparently, they're very humorous, but they're very hard-working. They're industrious type. But here is another thing. Just because they're givers doesn't mean they do it blindly. These are the people who care about the value of things. These are the people who care about the discounts. They'll check the price tags on everything. These are the people who are very wise with their money, but also very generous in how they do it. So because of this give, gifting, but here is a drawback with the gift of a giver, is that they can evaluate the spirituality of an individual based on how much they give. Okay? Every gift has this tendency to judge others based on what they have. They can look down upon others. A giver might judge others based on what others are giving. A prophet can judge others because they're not black and white. So every gifting has this issue where you're very judgmental about each other and they tend to evaluate, the giver tends to evaluate the spirituality based on how much another person gives. The final one is the exhorter. Exhorter is a class in itself. Exhorter, another way to put it, is an encourager. These are the people who have the supernatural ability that God gives them to come alongside people to help them, to strengthen the weak people, to steady those who are faltering, to comfort and counsel, console those who are troubled. They encourage them with the word of God. You know, one of the things with the gift of exhorter is they can walk into a room and all of a sudden you'll feel better. You'll feel better just because they're in the room. They have this ability to come in and with their presence itself and their words itself, it will make you feel like everything is just going to be fine. That is the gift of an exhorter. It's a very special gift. And when that person is missing in a body, you'll feel their absence. Because, oh man, all of a sudden you'll feel like everything is stressful. An exhorter has a gift to appeal to the will of an individual. And they can make you do things just by encouraging you. So now let's bring all these giftings together. If at all, all these descriptions didn't help you, now with this example, I want you to understand uh, where you belong, okay? It's these seven gifts. Imagine all of you are making a hospital visit, okay? You with me? Somebody's sick, church is visiting that individual in the hospital. The first thing, a prophet, let's put a prophet there. A prophet walks into the room, he has great compassion and emotion. 
okay he'll be extremely compassionate but he's stern with the truth and he'll quote some scriptures about healing he'll say oh the enemy can't prevail god is going to deliver you and be strong and steadfast and he proceeds to quote all the good things and the straightforward things from the bible he has no time for fluff he doesn't care for anything else he wants that person to know the truth because he's going to feel better soon that's a prophet are you one of those okay mercy a mercy comes a person with the gift of mercy comes he gently sits beside the bed holds the hands maybe shed a couple of tears compassion and they can stay for endless amount of hours with that individual just trying to be supportive in any way possible they feel their pain they feel their agony and they kind of are there for them that's the gift of mercy okay a servant imagine a gift of servant walks into this hospital the first thing he knows is make the bed straight fluff those pillows make sure those flowers are you know you see the servant is beginning to work he'll make sure that in this critical time of need everything is looking good so that the person can feel better if there's any trash around or anything she'll throw it in the garbage she'll throw it in the, like the servant has a practical element of how to make this for a person feel better a ruler gift of a ruler walks into the room he walks with a pen and a paper he says okay what needs to be done at home who is mowing your lawn who is taking care of your dishes who is uh, providing the meals for your family he'll begin to make a list and he has a clear cut plan for his life for the next season he'll organize all the people that are responsible he'll call upon the servants he'll call upon different kinds of giftings and says and he'll organize them and by the time he walks out of that room in the hospital he has a clear cut destination for that person's life the sixth person's life a ruler knows how to, how to extremely organize things so that the person can feel better a teacher walks into the room okay what do you think a teacher will do he sits there and he says what did the doctor say is wrong with you the first question he ask okay, what's wrong with you uh, it's called this and this condition oh did you check for a second opinion what are the symptoms for it he begins to do some analysis of his own about the condition of the patient and when he walks out of the room probably he'll stop and talk to few nurses there and say what is going on how can he feel better what is this condition called how long will he be in the hospital and then he'll go home and sit on google do his own research so that he can do his own assessment okay that is the gifting of a teacher what about a giver a giver is very simple he comes bearing gifts he brings some meal or brings some flowers so he, he brings something tangible so that this person can feel better an exhorter comes into the room all of a sudden you'll start making that person feel better by telling them great stories once upon a time when he was on a trip somewhere the same thing kind of happened to his buddy or his uncle or a niece and he brings those stories and he makes them laugh makes them feel better and all of a sudden hope comes and the person will begin to feel better right away you see how all these giftings in one situation can come and do an event that could transform a situation but here is a secret every gifting is critical for that sick person's life did you notice that if there's no servant no prophet no teacher no giver this person is left abandoned and this is the picture that god gives the church and this is how a body the body of christ functions so now who is a prophet in this congregation okay who is a, a who has the gift of mercy okay who has the gift of servanthood wow more servants who is a ruler okay you sometimes there is an overlap you're not exclusive one you can see so who is a teacher okay <laughs> who is a giver okay who is an exhorter ah uh, there you go see we are all sitting here with various different giftings in the body of christ they actually did a practical once where they went to a congregation 
and they kind of explained all the giftings and made all the rulers sit at one place and made all the teachers sit in one place, all the prophets sit in one place, all the servants sit in one place. And they said, okay, in Africa there is a situation where there are a bunch of kids running around in the streets and they're hungry and starving. Come up with a plan. And by the time all the giftings came up with their plans, they had a complete agenda as to how to take care of those kids. They had an orphanage built as a, as a hypothetical situation. They had the meals lined up. The rulers had everything organized for the week. You know, so there's amazingly phenomenal how things come together. This is the pattern that God established. And that's the menorah pattern of the Old Testament where you see a prophet complements with the gift of mercy. A servant complements with the gift of a ruler. A teacher is complemented with the gift of a giver. Uh, givers like to support teaching, to enable the crowd. That's one of the things. And an exhorter is a class in itself where he comes and everybody else feels better. So all these uh, things come together as a men or a pattern where the light shines in the temple, in the body of Christ, when everybody is fully operational in their gifting, in their fullest. Okay? But here is one word of caution for you. Just because you are a prophet doesn't mean you shouldn't be a servant. Just because you're a servant doesn't mean you don't show any mercy. We all need to strive to be good at the other giftings that we lack. A prophet needs to pray for mercy. A mercy person needs to pray for uh, becoming black and white in certain areas of life. So all these areas, they overlap each other and there's only one person in history who exhibited 100% um, traits in all these giftings that is Jesus Christ alone. He was a prophet, he was a servant, he was an exhorter, he was a teacher, he was a giver, he was a ruler. In all these giftings, he is the only person in this world who exhibited the full traits of the giftings of, a, of the redemptive gifts. So for us to become like Christ, meaning use the one gift that you already have and Develop in the other areas that you need to develop, but use the one that you already have. You know, the problem comes, ladies and gentlemen, I think people struggle big time in churches and out, outside churches too. They struggle with identity issues. They don't know who they are, and they try to be somebody else that they are not. That's where the problem is. If you try to be somebody else that you're not, we have a problem. And if the church tries to make you somebody that you're not, you will destroy the congregation. If you need to be yourself, be yourself that God made you to be. Come to the fullness and the maturity of your gifting and you will be effective in the body of Christ. So I want you to look at these giftings and say, Lord, I want to be used by you. I realize this is my identity. All my life I've been trying to become somebody else that I'm not. Help me to become what I'm supposed to be. And help me to reach to the full potential of what my gifting is. You with me so far? So it's very important to understand how we can function thoroughly and fully. Concluding with this scripture, Philippians 2.1. All comes back together to Christ. It says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit and of one mind. In spite of all this diversity in the body of Christ, we can still be one because we all have an ultimate purpose to bring his kingdom into this world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hope you're blessed by this sermon. I think it's very critical to understand. So servants, get to work. Rulers, start planning. And we can get things happening here. All right? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for how you do things in our life. We thank you for the way you have given us these precious gifts and we know there's nothing we can do to impress you to achieve or receive any of these giftings because they are a gift from you. Help us to recognize and identify our gifting. Help us to come to the full potential of our gifting. And help us to be effective in the body of Christ and in this world 
and help us to be useful and instrumental in changing many lives. Father, help us to come to that role and that position that you've already placed us in. And Father, may we honor you with what you've given us. And Father, if we lack in, our, in other areas of our gifting, uh, other areas of the gifting that you prescribed in your scriptures, help us to grow. Help us to come to maturity in those other areas as well. Father, we love you so much. We uh, are concerned by the state of this world. And in order to be effective, you've given us this local body to be a part of and help us to be effective within Seaside and help us to be effective outside Seaside. And Father, may we bring you honor and glory and thank you for our identity is rooted in Christ and Christ alone. Make us one, make us sacrificial, and make us functional and effective in your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully this teaching has blessed you today. Trust you will join us weekly in pursuing God through His Word. You can join us at seasidecommunity.org, Facebook, or via YouTube. We always enjoy our listeners' feedback, so send your comments and prayer requests to info at seasidecommunity.org, for we would love to hear from you. And now, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, 